your power Jesus take us all the way Welcome to Christ United Methodist Church. Hey, listen, we don't have any strangers here at Christ Church, just friends we haven't met yet, so greet your neighbors around you, make everybody feel welcome. I feel like I'm going to catch on. Neighbor? Well, good morning. My name, is, my name is Preston Morgan. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Christ United Methodist Church. Uh, it is an honor and a blessing to worship as a family this morning. If you'll turn in your worship guide on the front and on the inside cover, there are a few announcements that I'd like to make. The first is Pastor Dan has lined up uh, a whole series in the fall of opportunities to grow, uh, things to study, and the next one, our second session is going to be starting this is going to be a fantastic study. It's, it's enough by Adam Hamilton. I strongly recommend it. If you, uh, new children, youth, and adults, our, our, our groups are now forming. So please go to the website and you can register. More information on that is in your worship guide. In two weeks is our annual All Saints celebration um, where we, we celebrate the lives and remember those who have entered the church triumphant this year. Uh, you're, everyone is welcome to attend that Sunday morning worship service and after church, uh, we will have a, a small memorial for the mor memorial pavers, that's a tongue twister, a memorial for the memorial pavers outside the sanctuary. Our, our fourth and fifth grade missionaries are collecting small children's toys and teen gifts for the children of Mexico. Those bins are located downstairs. You can get more information from the website. And finally, our AV and stream team meeting will be meeting this Thursday. We're, we're getting ready to ramp up for all those wonderful Christmas Eve services. And so if you have any interest whatsoever, no experience necessary in joining uh, the audio team, the computer team, or the stream team, please join us Thursday evening out in the Welcome Center. But now, let us take a moment and center ourselves for worship. We're here to celebrate the work that we've seen God do in our lives this week. And as we prepare, let us stand and continue to sing God's praise.
come into our lives this morning. We ask you to fall upon us and to breathe your breath upon us because we know that we cannot do this without you. Father, just getting to church this morning, there were roadblocks on the way. But there are roadblocks on the way of the life of discipleship every day. You give us the grace and the perseverance to step beyond the things which would keep us from being your people. Holy Spirit, come and fall upon us. Love, come down and rescue us. Uh, For some of us need healing. Some of us struggle with disease or depression. Some of us are looking for meaning and for purpose. Love, come down and rescue us. For our world is in need of your presence more than it ever has been. We think of those uh, Christians who, who live in places where it is increasingly difficult. And even those who have been called upon to bear the ultimate sacrifice to profess faith in you, Jesus Christ. We sit so comfortably in our sanctuary this morning, it is easy to forget them, but Lord, put them on our minds, so bring the pictures of them to our heads. Let us understand that they are, they are the same family, and we are their brothers and sisters, and they are ours. Father, we pray for those in Mexico. We thank you for, for our friend who's here this morning, Pastor Pina. And we pray, Father, that his ministry will be uh, blessed by your spirit in a way that will cause it to flourish and to multiply manifold. We pray, Father, that as he brings the word to those in his community, that they will listen and respond with joy. We ask you, Father, to provide for his needs for those of his, of, of his church. Father, uh, all these things we would come bringing before you this morning uh, because if you don't come down and rescue us, no one will. We enable us now to be the kind of people who bring you the praise and the glory just by the living of our lives. For all this we would pray in the strong name of Jesus, the name in which every knee will bow one day and every tongue will confess that he is Lord praying the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of illumination printed in your bulletin just before today's scripture reading. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The reading today is from the Old Testament, Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, and I am reading from the New International Version. Here is my servant who I am uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. 
He will not shout out or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks to Most of you know that our congregation has had a long-standing, warm, and intimate relationship with the La Trinidad congregation in Reynosa, Mexico. Yesterday, their pastor and his family and his colleague Arturo made the long trip in a car to come here and let us know how grateful they are for this relationship that we have had and will continue. So at this time I invite Olinda and Pastor Noe and Arturo to come on up. Pastor Noe would like to greet you this morning and say a few words. Buenos días. Esta mañana queremos dar gracias a Dios por la iglesia y por el equipo pastoral. This morning we would like to say thank you. Can you hear me? This morning we would like to say thank you for all the support and for the pastoral support you have given us. Thank you. Okay. Queremos dar gracias a Dios porque nos reciben. We like to say thank you because you have received us. Y esta mañana queremos dar un reconocimiento and this morning we would like to give you a small gift por el trabajo misionero que ha realizado la iglesia for all your mission support that your church has helped us with apoyando a nuestra iglesia La Trinidad helping our church La Trinidad es un reconocimiento para todos ustedes Muchas gracias. Que Dios les bendiga. It's a small gift for all of you. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Gracias, hermano. Uh, we invite our children to, to, to come for just a few minutes here at the, at the chancel. Today I thought we'd be talking about uh, about humility, um, and, and I was wondering if anybody knows what that is. What what is humility? Does anybody know? What is humility? Anybody know what that? Excuse me. What's that? If you're embarrassed in front of crowds, sometimes, yeah, that could be. Well, let's see. That could be maybe some, yeah, uh, 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 what'd you say? Oh, if you get invited for the crowds, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. What else is humility, though? What do you think it is? Looking at yourself in the mirror? <laughs> there used to be this song that said, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> Can't wait to get in the morning because I get I'm better looking each day. Um, well, you know what? I, I think maybe it's the opposite of looking in the mirror all the time. Maybe humility is about caring for other people more so that you're not concerned about what you look like or, or who you are, but what they are and what they need, okay? Pastor Dan's going to be speaking about that in a few moments. It's about... <laughs> Putting other people first and putting ourselves second. In fact, there's a way, this is called Count It All Joy all this month. And somebody once said joy, uh, which is spelled J-O-Y, 
means Jesus first, others second, and you third. How do you, th how do you think that might work for you? Yeah, it'd be okay to put, to put Jesus first, okay, and other people second, and you and the mirror third. Let's pray together then. Father, thank you for this time and for this opportunity. Uh, and I pray, Father, that we will be children, all of us, who put you first and then others and then ourselves. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up. And you can go to the children's choir now. Glad you're here this morning. We're going to invite our ushers to come forward for the offering. While they're doing that, if you will register your presence here. Uh, and we invite you to be generous, uh, as, as always. Uh, the Lord has a lot of work for us to, 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 to be doing. Amen.
Que bueno. Amen. Amen. All right. Today we continue our sermon series on Count It All Joy, and uh, it's based on the book of Philippians. Philippians is a very positive letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi as he was in prison in Rome. Last week in chapter 1, uh, we discussed how nothing compares to the joy of knowing Christ regardless of our circumstances and that suffering for our faith can be even seen as a privilege. In today's readings, we turn to chapter 2 and learn about humility and the example of Christ. Uh, having been assigned the topic of humility for a sermon, which I had never preached before, I was a little... Okay, we found the problem. Uh, I was a little nervous to be preaching about humility because um, you come on too strong. It doesn't seem very humble. And then I realized, well, you really have nothing to lose because who is going to say that sermon on humility was the worst sermon I ever heard, right? <clears throat> so um, in uh, Philippians, we're turning to uh, the first 13 verses. Listen for God's word for you today. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves." Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Amen. The idea of humility is woven throughout these passages. We know humility to be a virtue, a good character trait for us to have as Christians. It may be a little scarce in our culture today. It usually isn't thought of as a quality that helps you get ahead in the workforce. After all, we have to be an advocate for ourselves, try to market ourselves and show our strengths and find and create opportunities for our talents to be used and noticed, appreciated, valued, and paid for. In competitive environments, we might think humility would hold us back and not be an asset for self-advancement. It might just get in the way. In fact, at the time of the writing of Paul's letter, the predominant view of the culture saw humility that way too. According to Gordon Fee's commentary on Philippians, humility is a uniquely Christian virtue which as with the message of a crucified Messiah, stands in utter contradiction to the values of the Greco-Roman world, who generally considered humility not a virtue, but a shortcoming. In Greek, it is a compound word meaning lowly and mind. Anyone here ever put having greater humility on your New Year's resolution list? Or perhaps a life goal? I'm guessing probably not. But in relationships, it's different. It's, 
it's perhaps nothing more could help us in our relationships more than having humility. Um, and it's something that we can't have in isolation apart from relationships in community. We can't have it in isolation. It's not just being able to see things from other people's point of view, but as Paul is describing it, it's being willing to assess the needs and interests of others and to intentionally choose them to put them on a higher priority level than our own. It's a shift in focus away from the mirror, away from the self, to others in community and the community as a whole. Paul's focus was on the community of Philippi. He founded that church through his missionary work and he felt a deep sense of personal investment and love and connection with them. But they weren't getting along and he was stuck in prison all the way in Rome. There was turmoil in the church and as their mentor, Paul shares with them that it would bring him such great joy if through humility they could find unity again. Paul asked them in his own words to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And the word here for selfish ambition has connotations of self-advancement at the expense of others. And vain conceit means empty glory or thinking too highly of oneself without having grounds for doing so. In Paul's words, he's saying, in humility, do not look to your own interests, but each one to the interests of others. He's not saying, see other people as better than you, uh, but to view their needs and concerns as more important than your own. To draw the contrast even more directly, where we see selfish ambition at work, we are to replace it with love where we see empty glory, to replace it with humility, not false humility, but real humility. What would it look like in a community if everyone practiced that kind of humility? Three weeks ago in the Marks of Living Faith sermon series, I preached at one of the other morning worship services about prayer and shared a personal story uh, that meant a lot to me as I had opportunity to meet Mother Teresa in 1994. And at the time, she had said something about prayer, so it was relevant. And I almost didn't include it because I didn't want to be one of those people who drop names of famous people uh, just to try to impress, you know. Uh, but earlier in that week, I went to Preston and asked him if he had any books on prayer. And he mentioned the Mother Teresa quote and emailed me the link to the same words that were on the business card that she gave me at the time. And so on the screen is the picture and the card that I received in that experience. And um, I share it with you because uh, it's a blessing to you as well. She's not only an example of prayer, but um, an example of humble service. And plus, I didn't want you to feel left out because I shared it with another worship service and not you. <laughs> um, the discernment that she discovered in her relationship with God led her to leave the comforts of living in a convent in Calcutta, India, the security of teaching in a school, to living and working among the poorest of the poor. Excuse me a minute. <laughs> On the streets of Calcutta, and with almost no funding, took a venture of faith to start a new order of the church called the Missionaries of Charity and established her first home for the sick and dying in Calcutta. Now that's really humble service. That's a real personal e example of placing the needs of others ahead of your own. But it's still nothing compared to the example of humility that we find in Christ. In verses 5 through 6, Paul writes to have the same mindset of Christ, who was God, but didn't consider equality with God to be used for his own advantage. To use the language of our culture, Jesus in his nature was God, and therefore had the rights 
of God, but he chose to lay them down to become human and humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross. He was not just a good moral example. Jesus was God. And Jesus chose to surrender his rights out of obedience to the Father for the higher purposes that the Trinity would have to bless humankind. We and ourselves, we have no rights in our relationship with God. It sounds kind of harsh because we live in a very rights-focused culture. Theologian Charles Spurgeon wrote, humility is to make a right estimate of oneself. When we think about it, God really doesn't owe us anything. Mother Teresa didn't have any rights before God either, but Jesus did, and he chose to lay them down for you and for me and for all of humanity. In taking a quick walk through the life of Jesus, we see an incredible example and model of humility for us because he was always placing the interest and needs of others ahead of his own. At times, probably he would have preferred some rest, uh, yet he chose to meet the outsiders beyond his own people of the Jewish faith to bring them healing, to cast out demons, to spread teachings about the kingdom of God to both Jew and Gentile. And in doing so, he defiled himself by the Jewish holiness code. He ruined his reputation in the religious community by being with those he chose to have dinner with. He allowed such people who sought him out to trump everything else going on in his schedule. And he allowed himself to be interrupted. And to those within the Jewish community that he was a part of, he showed incredible patience in teaching them again and again. And even though one of them was to betray him and have him killed, still he chose to take the role of a servant in washing their feet, all of their feet, and for both the Jew and the Gentile, he saw their interest as greater than his survival instinct and chose to lay down his life in a brutal death by crucifixion. Today's scriptures go on to say that Christ was then exalted to the highest place with God, that all will sooner or later acknowledge the lordship of Christ to the glory of the Father. The pattern of this movement of tracing Jesus from pre-existence to coming into our world as a human to dying on the cross to being exalted in glory with the Father is one that happens again and again throughout the letters of the New Testament in what we call the ancient hymns. In the world of biblical scholarship, we count the letters of Paul among the very earliest and closest to the times of Jesus in terms of when the words were actually written down. And where Paul is using a previous source, we know it is earlier still, which shows that even from the earliest beginnings of the Christian church, the incarnation of God and Jesus, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Christ was at the core of their beliefs, was at the core of their hope, was at the core of their joy. For through life in Jesus, they had hope of their own resurrection for the day of Christ that is yet to come. And in the meantime, they had this joy of relating to God through the grace of Jesus Christ in the everyday, in the good days, in the hard days. They had this incredible example of humility before others and the joy of knowing and serving others and helping them live and grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. It is this hope, this joy that so fills the book of Philippians, not only to gain knowledge about God, but to know God personally and to relate to God through the grace of Jesus Christ Paul calls it salvation. And it all begins with a step of humility for us. When I was taking a basic Christian theology class in seminary, this image was shared with me, and Dr. Steve Siemens deserves credit for sending it to me this week. It's somewhat hard to tell 
all of the different panels of this stained glass window. Uh, so I'll just describe it for you briefly with words. Uh, it stood originally in the library of Drew University and was recreated. Originally, it was 1883 when Henry Holliday, uh, a craftsman in the art of stained glass, created it. He left behind for us a letter of interpretation of the symbolism. At the very center of the window is a representation of knowing God, seated upon the world with the words, Theologia. The theme verse for this portion of the window is Isaiah 55, verse 9. As the heavens are exalted from the earth, so are my ways exalted from your ways. The dove in the panel that rests on her shoulder symbolizes the voice of God with angels bowing behind her that symbolize wisdom. Above the center from left to right are three images that convey the cardinal virtues of faith, charity, and hope. The lower left panel shows philosophy and history. The lower right panel shows science and art. At the foot of the center circle is the figure of a woman seated on the ground taking the hand of a smaller, younger figure and directing him to face the center of the window. Now, who do you think that might represent? It's humility. And without humility, the theologian never even makes it to the window in the first place. According to Holiday, the theme verse for the humility panel is Psalm 25, verse 9, which says, He shall teach the lowly his ways. The beginning of a journey of learning or the beginning of a journey with God starts with the decision to accept the invitation to begin. It must come from a place of humility. For oftentimes it is when what we as parents like to call a teachable moment. It's a moment of acknowledging we don't know everything. When we bump up against our own personal limitations, when we realize that we need help, that we have a lot to learn, that we need God, and we need the community of God called the church. It's when the pride of different sorts that has somehow kept us from experience the fullness of Christ has been stripped away. And there remains a tremendous openness to knowing and faithfully following God. As Pastor Mark Batterson has recently written, you can't be filled with the Spirit if you're full of yourself. Paul's invitation in verses 12 through 13 is about salvation and personally knowing God through faith in Christ. It is not taking salvation for granted. It is not getting complacent in our faith but continuing to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It's something we receive by grace, but it's also something that we continue in obedience in carrying it out. It's not a fear of dread, but being filled with a holy awe and wonder of God. It follows from the previous three verses that describe the grandeur of the vision of the glorified Christ as Lord to which every knee will bow. It's a process of continual growth or by the grace of God going on to perfection and humility. It's a journey filled with lots of obstacles and one of the biggest is pride. Intellectual pride, spiritual pride, other kinds of pride. Thomas Jefferson was not known to have a humble approach to the scriptures as he created his own canon by removing the parts of the Bible that he didn't like with a pair of scissors. And in doing so, he misapplied his gift of cr critical thinking to the omission of scriptures instead of the interpretation of them. Albert Einstein, arguably one of the smartest men who ever lived, knew humility before God and respect for the queen of the sciences when he said, I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are mere details. 
Jesus warned against spiritual pride through many different encounters with the Pharisees, not the least of which was his not-so-subtle parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector going to the temple to pray. In it, the Pharisee was thanking God that he's not like that tax collector and thanking God of how spiritual he is, where the tax collector simply prays to God, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says the tax collector goes home justified before God and not the Pharisee, and that for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The Christian journey begins and ends in humility, first acknowledging our need for God's grace and forgiveness at the beginning, and at the ending, with bowing before Jesus Christ and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In following Jesus' example and teachings, we can keep a humble attitude in our relationship with God and with others as we approach God in prayer. It's a humble approach in how we read and understand the scriptures. In humility, we stand ready to change our mind or our direction based on how God's word or God's will would direct us. And so, to follow these three sections of scripture, we seek unity through humility in the body of Christ. We follow the example of humility that Christ has set for us all. And in humility, we work out our salvation, trying not to allow our pride to get in the way. I don't claim to have this all together. Still trying, still learning, still growing. Um, still trying to be aware of my strengths and my weaknesses, but trying not to give too much attention to either of them. Striving for authenticity in relationships where I choose my words and actions with others in ways that come not from a base of pride or a grasp for attention or a gross under underestimation of self. As C.S. Lewis has written, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. I think when we have the ability to laugh at ourselves, when we, can, when we can admit when we're wrong, when we don't take ourselves too seriously, when we're not overly trying to impress others but primarily focused on pleasing God, we are on the right track in regard to humility. And we don't take on false humility for appearance's sake, but keep it real with our people, especially those in our community that can help us to stay grounded. Thomas Merton has said that pride makes us artificial and humility makes us real. We can look to Jesus as our example and his humble servant leadership and willingness to show sacrificial love when we place the needs and interests of others in the body of Christ ahead of our own, we're not only seeking unity and humility in the body of Christ, but we're following Christ's example. So friends, let's not let pride keep us from finding fullness in Christ and not forget the humility that we had when we first set out upon this journey with Christ the Apostle Paul, who was so filled with the joy of Christ, even in the harshest of circumstances, like the prison cell he was writing from, also knew it was never about his comfort, was never about his fulfillment even, but it was about being faithful, being found in Christ, and sharing Christ with the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That is the proof of God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Remember that on the night in which Jesus gathered his friends in the upper room for the Passover meal, that when the supper had concluded, he took bread. He broke it. He gave it to his friends and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you, for many, for all, for the forgiveness of their sins. He said, Do this as often as you shall do it in remembrance of me. Which was to tell them, Whenever you eat bread, every day, remember me. And when the supper concluded, he took the cup as well. He said a prayer of blessing over it. Gave thanks to God who brings forth the fruit from the vine. And then he gave it to his friends and said, you drink from this, all of you, because this represents something. This is the blood of the new covenant, my blood which will be poured out and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Paul told us that when he said Jesus emptied himself. Then Jesus said, do this as often as you shall do it in remembrance of me. They drank the wine every day. Every day, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these acts of God in Jesus Christ, we come now offering ourselves in praise and thanksgiving in union with Christ offering for us. We proclaim together the mystery of faith, and you know it. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, for our spirit on us gathered here in all these gifts of bread and juice, make them be the body and blood of Christ for us so that we may be the body of Christ for the world redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. That means all are welcome here this morning. This is not a Methodist table. It's just the Lord's table. And if you've come and you love Jesus or you want to be loved by Jesus, you are welcome here. I'll invite those who are our assisting to, to please come forward. And Pastor Pena, if, if you'll come as well, please.
Thanks be to God for his love for us. If you're here this morning and you do not have a church family, if you're looking for some people to hang out with and call brother and sister and let them love on you, we would invite you to come meet us here at the front as we have our, have our closing song. David. Once again, I say amen, and it's still raining. As the thunder rolls, barely hear whisper through the rain. I'm with you as your mercy falls. Raise my hands, praise the God who gives and takes away. almost gone how can I carry on if I can't find you as the thunder rolls barely hear whisper through the rain I'm with you as your mercy falls I raise my hands praise the God who gives and takes away I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I'll praise you in this storm. I will lift my hands. Every 
as you leave this place, I leave this comforting and encouraging word of scripture with you from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And now look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider he who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. So go in the peace and the grace of the one who is within you to save you, who is before you to lead the way. And in the good days and in the bad days is the source and the grounds of our hope and our joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Have a great week, everybody.